American Power and the New Mandarins. By Professor Noam Chomsky, first printed in 1967. To the brave young men and women who refused to serve in a criminal war. Objectivity and Liberal Scholarship Part 1 Author's Note Parts of this essay were delivered as a lecture at New York University in March 1968 as part of the Albert Schweitzer Lecture Series, and will appear in Power and Consciousness in Society, edited by Connor Cruz O'Brien and published by New York University Press. I am indebted to Paul Potter, Andre Schifrin, and William Watson for very helpful comments. In a recent essay, Connor Cruz O'Brien speaks of the process of counter-revolutionary subordination which poses a threat to scholarly integrity in our own counter-revolutionary society, just as revolutionary subordination, a phenomenon often noted and rightly deplored, has undermined scholarly integrity in revolutionary and post-revolutionary situations. He observes that power in our time has more intelligence in its service, and allows that intelligence more discretion as to its methods, than ever before in history, and suggests that this development is not altogether encouraging, since we have moved perceptibly towards the state of a society maimed through the systematic corruption of its intelligence. He urges that increased and specific vigilance, not just the elaboration of general principles, is required from the intellectual community towards specific growing dangers to its integrity. Senator Fulbright has developed a similar theme in an important and perceptive speech. He describes the failure of the universities to form an effective counterweight to the military-industrial complex by strengthening their emphasis on the traditional values of our democracy. Instead they have joined the monolith, adding greatly to its power and influence. Specifically, he refers to the failure of the social scientists, who ought to be acting as responsible and independent critics of the government's policies, but who instead become the agents of these policies. While young dissenters plead for resurrection of the American promise, their elders continue to subvert it. With the surrender of independence, the neglect of teaching, and the distortion of scholarship, the university is not only failing to meet its responsibilities to its students, it is betraying a public trust. The extent of this betrayal might be argued, its existence, as a threatening tendency, is hardly in doubt. Senator Fulbright mentions one primary cause, the access to money and influence. Others might be mentioned, for example, a highly restrictive, almost universally shared ideology, and the inherent dynamics of professionalization. As to the former, Fulbright has cited elsewhere the observation of de Tocqueville, I know of no country in which there is so little independence of mind and real freedom of discussion as in America. Free institutions certainly exist, but a tradition of passivity and conformism restricts their use. The cynic might say this is why they continue to exist. The impact of professionalization is also quite clear. The free-floating intellectual may occupy himself with problems because of their inherent interest and importance, perhaps to little effect. The professional, however, tends to define his problems on the basis of the technique that he has mastered, and has a natural desire to apply his skills. Commenting on this process, Senator Clark quotes the remarks of Dr. Harold Agnew, director of the Los Alamos Laboratories Weapons Division, the basis of advanced technology is innovation and nothing is more stifling to innovation than seeing one's product not used or ruled out of consideration on flimsy premises involving public world opinion. A shocking statement and a dangerous one, as Clark rightly comments. 
In much the same way, behavioral scientists who believe themselves to be in possession of certain techniques of control and manipulation will tend to search for problems to which their knowledge and skills might be relevant, defining these as the important problems, and it will come as no surprise that they occasionally express their contempt for flimsy premises involving public world opinion that restrict the application of these skills. Thus among engineers, there are the weapons cultists who construct their bombs and missiles, and among the behavioral scientists, we find the technicians who design and carry out experiments with population and resources control methods in Vietnam. These various factors Access to power, shared ideology, professionalization may or may not be deplorable in themselves, but there can be no doubt that they interact so as to pose a serious threat to the integrity of scholarship in fields that are struggling for intellectual content and are thus particularly susceptible to the workings of a kind of Gresham's law. What is more, the subversion of scholarship poses a threat to society at large. The danger is particularly great in a society that encourages specialization and stands in awe of technical expertise. In such circumstances, the opportunities are great for the abuse of knowledge and technique. To be more exact, the claim to knowledge and technique. Taking note of these dangers, one reads with concern the claims of some social scientists that their discipline is essential for the training of those to whom they refer as the mandarins of the future. Philosophy and literature still have their value, so Ethel Poole informs us, but it is psychology, sociology, systems analysis, and political science that provide the knowledge by which men of power are humanized and civilized. In no small measure, the Vietnam War was designed and executed by these new mandarins, and it testifies to the concept of humanity and civilization they are likely to bring to the exercise of power. Is the new access to power of the technical intelligentsia a delusion or a growing reality? There are those who perceive the skeletal structure of a new society in which the leadership will rest with the research corporation, the industrial laboratories, the experimental stations, and the universities, with the scientists, the mathematicians, the economists, and the engineers of the new computer technology. Not only the best talents, but eventually the entire complex of social prestige and social status, will be rooted in the intellectual and scientific communities. A careful look at the skeletal structure of this new society, if such it is, is hardly reassuring. As Daniel Bell points out, it has been war rather than peace that has been largely responsible for the acceptance of planning and technocratic modes in government, and our present mobilized society is one that is geared to the social goal of military and war preparedness. Bell's relative optimism regarding the new society comes from his assumption that the university is the place where theoretical knowledge is sought, tested, and codified in a disinterested way and that the mobilized postures of the Cold War and the space race are a temporary aberration, a reaction to communist aggressiveness. In contrast, a strong argument can be made that the university has, to a significant degree, betrayed its public trust, that matters of foreign policy are very much a reflex of internal political forces as well as of economic institutions, rather than a judgment about the national interest, involving strategy decisions based on the calculations of an opponent's strength and intentions, that the mobilization for war is not irony but a natural development, given our present social end economic organization, that the technologists who achieve power are those who can perform a service for existing institutions, and that nothing but catastrophe is to be expected from still further centralization of decision making in government and a narrowing base of corporate affiliates. The experience of the past few years gives little reason to feel optimistic about these developments. Quite generally, what grounds are there for supposing that those whose claim to power is based on knowledge and technique will be more benign in their exercise of power than those whose claim is based on wealth or aristocratic origin? On the contrary, one might expect the new Mandarin to be dangerously arrogant, aggressive, and incapable of adjusting to failure, as compared with his predecessor, whose claim to power was not diminished by honesty as to the limitations of his knowledge, lack of work to do, or demonstrable mistakes. In the Vietnam catastrophe, all of these factors are detectable. There is no point in overgeneralizing, 
but neither history nor psychology nor sociology gives us any particular reason to look forward with hope to the rule of the new mandarins. In general, one would expect any group with access to power and affluence to construct an ideology that will justify the state of affairs on grounds of the general welfare. For just this reason, Bell's thesis that intellectuals are moving closer to the center of power, or at least being absorbed more fully into the decision-making structure, is to some extent supported by the phenomenon of counter-revolutionary subordination noted earlier. That is, one might anticipate that as power becomes more accessible, the inequities of the society will recede from vision, the status quo will seem less flawed, and the preservation of order will become a matter of transcendent importance. The fact is that American intellectuals are increasingly achieving the status of a doubly privileged elite, first, as American citizens, with respect to the rest of the world, and second, because of their role in American society, which is surely quite central, whether or not Bell's prediction proves accurate. In such a situation, the dangers of counter-revolutionary subordination, in both the domestic and the international arena, are apparent. I think that O'Brien is entirely correct in pointing to the necessity for increased and specific vigilance towards the danger of counter-revolutionary subordination, of which, as he correctly remarks, we hear almost nothing. I would like to devote this essay to a number of examples. Several years ago it was enthusiastically proclaimed that the fundamental political problems of the Industrial Revolution have been solved, and that this very triumph of democratic social evolution in the West ends domestic politics for those intellectuals who must have ideologies or utopias to motivate them to social action. During this period of faith in the end of ideology, even enlightened and informed commentators were inclined to present the most remarkable evaluations of the state of American society. Daniel Bell, for example, wrote that in the mass consumption economy all groups can easily acquire the outward badges of status and erase the visible demarcations. Writing in commentary in October 1964, he maintained that we have in effect already achieved the egalitarian and socially mobile society which the free-floating intellectuals associated with the Marxist tradition have been calling for during the last hundred years. Granting the obvious general rise in standard of living, the judgment of Gunnar Muerdal seems far more appropriate to the actual situation when he says, the common idea that America is an immensely rich and affluent country is very much an exaggeration. American affluence is heavily mortgaged. America carries a tremendous burden of debt to its poor people. That this debt must be paid is not only a wish of the do-gooders. Not paying it implies a risk for the social order and for democracy as we have known it. Surely the claim that all groups can easily enter the mass consumption economy and erase the visible demarcations is a considerable exaggeration. Similar evaluations of American society appear frequently in contemporary scholarship. To mention just one example, consider the analysis that Adam Ulam gives of Marx's concept of capitalism, one cannot blame a contemporary observer like Marx for his conviction that industrial fanaticism and self-righteousness were indelible traits of the capitalist. That the capitalist would grow more humane, that he would slacken in his ceaseless pursuit of accumulation and expansion, were not impressions readily warranted by the English social scene of the 1840s and 1850s. Again, granting the important changes in industrial society over the past century, it still comes as a surprise to hear that the capitalist has slackened in his ceaseless pursuit of accumulation and expansion. Remarks such as these illustrate a failure to come to grips with the reality of contemporary society which may not be directly traceable to the newly found, or at least hopefully sought, access to power and affluence, but which is, nevertheless, what one would expect in the developing ideology of a new privileged elite. Various strands of this ideology are drawn together in a recent article by Spignu Brzezinski, in which a number of the conceptions and attitudes that appear in recent social thought are summarized. I am tempted to say parroted. Brzezinski too sees a profound change taking place in the intellectual community, as the largely humanist-oriented, occasionally ideologically-minded intellectual dissenter, 
who sees his role largely in terms of proffering social critiques, is rapidly being displaced either by experts and specialists, who become involved in special governmental undertakings, or by the generalists integrators, who become in effect house ideologues for those in power, providing overall intellectual integration for disparate actions. He suggests that these organization-oriented, application-minded intellectuals can be expected to introduce broader and more relevant concerns into the political system. Though there is, as he notes, a danger that intellectual detachment and the disinterested search for truth will come to an end, given the new access of the application-minded intellectuals to power, prestige and the good life. They are a new meritocratic elite, taking over American life, utilizing the universities, exploiting the latest techniques of communications, harnessing as rapidly as possible the most recent technological devices. Presumably, their civilizing impact is revealed by the great progress that has been made, in this new historical era that America alone has already entered, with respect to the problems that confounded the bumbling political leaders of past eras. The problems of the cities, of pollution, of waste and destructiveness, of exploitation and poverty. Under the leadership of this new breed of politician intellectual, America has become the creative society, the others, consciously and unconsciously, are emulative. We see this, for example, in mathematics, the biological sciences, anthropology, philosophy, cinema, music, historical scholarship, and so on, where other cultures, hopelessly outdistanced, merely observe and imitate what America creates. Thus we move towards a new worldwide superculture, strongly influenced by American life, with its own universal electronic computer language, with an enormous and growing psychocultural gap separating America from the rest of the developed world. It is impossible even to imagine what Brzezinski thinks a universal electronic computer language may be, or what cultural values he thinks will be created by the new technologically dominant and conditioned Technotron who, he apparently believes, may prove to be the true repository of that indefinable quality we call human. It would hardly be rewarding to try to disentangle Brzezinski's confusions and misunderstandings. What is interesting, rather, is the way his dim awareness of current developments in science and technology is used to provide an ideological justification for the increasing role in the key decision-making institutions of individuals with special intellectual and scientific attainments, the new organization-oriented, application-minded intellectuals based in the university, the creative eye of the massive communications complex. Parallel to the assumption that all is basically well at home is the widely articulated belief that the problems of international society, too, would be subject to intelligent management were it not for the machinations of the communists. One aspect of this complacence is the belief that the Cold War was entirely the result of Russian, later Chinese, aggressiveness. For example, Daniel Bell has described the origins of the Cold War in the following terms, when the Russians began stirring up the Greek guerrilla EAM in what had been tacitly acknowledged at Tehran as a British sphere of influence, the communists began their cry against Anglo-American imperialism. Following the rejection of the Marshall Plan and the communist coup in Czechoslovakia in February, 1948, the Cold War was on in earnest clearly, this will hardly do as a balanced and objective statement of the origins of the Cold War, but the distortion it reflects is an inherent element in Bell's optimism about the new society, since it enables him to maintain that our Cold War posture is purely reactive, and that once communist belligerence is tamed, the new technical intelligentsia can turn its attention to the construction of a more decent society. A related element in the ideology of the liberal intellectual is the firm belief in the fundamental generosity of Western policy towards the Third World. Adam Ulam again provides a typical example, problems of an international society undergoing an economic and ideological revolution seem to defy, the generosity granted its qualifications and errors that has characterized the policy of the leading democratic powers of the West. Even Hans Morgenthau succumbs to this illusion. He summarizes a discussion of intervention with these remarks, we have intervened in the political, military, and economic affairs of other countries to the tune of far in excess of $100 billion, 
and we are at present involved in a costly and risky war in order to build a nation in South Vietnam. Only the enemies of the United States will question the generosity of these efforts, which have no parallel in history. Whatever one may think about the $100 billion, it is difficult to see why anyone should take seriously the professed generosity of our effort to build a nation in South Vietnam, any more than the similar professions of benevolence by our many forerunners in such enterprises. Generosity has never been a commodity in short supply among powers bent on extending their hegemony. Still another strand in the ideology of the new emerging elite is the concern for order, for maintaining the status quo, which is now seen to be quite favorable and essentially just. An excellent example is the statement by 14 leading political scientists and historians on United States Asian policy, recently distributed by the Freedom House Public Affairs Institute. These scholars designate themselves as the moderate segment of the academic community. The designation is accurate, they stand midway between the two varieties of extremism, one which demands that we destroy everyone who stands in our path, the other, that we adopt the principles of international behavior we require of every other world power. The purpose of their statement is to challenge those among us who, overwhelmed by guilt complexes, find comfort in asserting or implying that we are always wrong, our critics always right, and that only doom lies ahead. They find our record in Asia to be remarkably good, and applaud our demonstrated ability to rectify mistakes, our capacity for pragmatism and self-examination, and our healthy avoidance of narrow nationalism, capacities which distinguish us among the major societies of this era. The moderate scholars warn that to avoid a major war in the Asia-Pacific region, it is essential that the United States continue to deter, restrain, and counterbalance Chinese power. True, China has exercised great prudence in avoiding a direct confrontation with the United States or the Soviet Union since the Korean War, and it is likely that China will continue to substitute words for acts while concentrating upon domestic issues. Still, we cannot be certain of this and must therefore continue our efforts to tame the dragon. One of the gravest problems posed by China is its policy of isolationist fanaticism. Obviously, a serious threat to peace. Another danger is the terrifying figure of Mao Zedong, a romantic, who refuses to accept the bureaucratism essential to the ordering of this enormously complex, extremely difficult society. The moderate scholars would feel much more at ease with the familiar sort of technical expert, who is committed to the triumph of bureaucratism and who refrains from romantic efforts to undermine the party apparatus and the discipline it imposes. Furthermore, the moderate scholars announce their support for our basic position in Vietnam. A communist victory in Vietnam, they argue, would gravely jeopardize the possibilities for a political equilibrium in Asia, seriously damage our credibility, deeply affect the morale and the policies of our Asian allies and the neutrals. By a political equilibrium, they do not, of course, refer to the status quo as of 1945 to 1946 or as outlined by international agreement at Geneva in 1954. They do not explain why the credibility of the United States is more important than the credibility of the indigenous elements in Vietnam who have dedicated themselves to a war of national liberation. Nor do they explain why the morale of the military dictatorships of Thailand and Taiwan must be preserved. They merely hint darkly of the dangers of a third world war, dangers which are real enough and which are increased when advocates of revolutionary change face an external counter-revolutionary force. In principle, such dangers can be lessened by damping revolutionary ardor or by withdrawing the counter-revolutionary force. The latter alternative, however, is unthinkable, irresponsible. The crucial assumption in the program of the moderate scholars is that we must not encourage those elements committed to the thesis that violence is the best means of effecting change. It is important to recognize that it is not violence as such to which the moderate scholars object. On the contrary, they approve of our violence in Vietnam, which, as they are well aware, enormously exceeds that of the Vietnamese enemy. To further underline this point, they cite as our greatest triumph in Southeast Asia the dramatic changes which have taken place in Indonesia. The most dramatic being the massacre of several hundred thousand people. 
But this massacre, like our extermination of Vietnamese, is not a use of violence to effect social change and is therefore legitimate. What is more, it may be that those massacred were largely ethnic Chinese and landless peasants, and that the counter coup in effect re established traditional authority more firmly. If so, all the more reason why we should not deplore this use of violence, and in fact, the moderate scholars delicately refrain from alluding to it in their discussion of dramatic changes in Indonesia. We must conclude that when these scholars deplore the use of violence to effect change, it is not the violence but rather steps towards social change that they find truly disturbing. Social change that departs from the course we plot is not to be tolerated. The threat to order is too great. So great is the importance of stability and order that even reform of the sort that receives American authorization must often be delayed, the moderate scholars emphasize. Indeed, many types of reform increase instability, however desirable and essential they may be in long-range terms. For people under siege, there is no substitute for security. The reference, needless to say, is not to security from American bombardment, but rather to security from the wrong sorts of political and social change. The policy recommendations of the moderate scholars are based on their particular ideological bias, namely, that a certain form of stability. Not that of North Vietnam or North Korea, but that of Thailand, Taiwan, or the Philippines. Is so essential that we must be willing to use our unparalleled means of violence to ensure that it is preserved. It is instructive to see how other mentors of the new mandarins describe the problem of order and reform. Ithiel Pool formulates the central issue as follows. Quote, in the Congo, in Vietnam, in the Dominican Republic, it is clear that order depends on somehow compelling newly mobilized strata to return to a measure of passivity and defeatism from which they have recently been aroused by the process of modernization. At least temporarily, the maintenance of order requires a lowering of newly acquired aspirations and levels of political activity. Quote, this is what we have learned in the past 30 years of intensive empirical study of contemporary societies. Poole is merely describing facts, not proposing policy. A corresponding version of the facts is familiar on the domestic scene, workers threaten the public order by striking for their demands, the impatience of the Negro community threatens the stability of the body politic. One can, of course, imagine another way in which order can be preserved in all such cases, namely, by meeting the demands, or at the very least by removing the barriers that have been placed, by force which may be latent and disguised, in the way of attempts to satisfy the newly acquired aspirations. But this might mean that the wealthy and powerful would have to sacrifice some degree of privilege, and it is therefore excluded as a method for maintenance of order. Such proposals are likely to meet with little sympathy from Poole's new mandarins. From the doubly privileged position of the American scholar, the transcendent importance of order, stability, and nonviolence, by the oppressed, seems entirely obvious, to others, the matter is not so simple. If we listen, we hear such voices as this, from an economist in India. Quote, it is disingenuous to invoke democracy, due process of law, nonviolence, to rationalize the absence of action. For meaningful concepts under such conditions become meaningless since, in reality, they justify the relentless pervasive exploitation of the masses, at once a denial of democracy and a more sinister form of violence perpetrated on the overwhelming majority through contractual forms. Quote, Moderate American scholarship does not seem capable of comprehending these simple truths. It would be wrong to leave the impression that the ideology of the liberal intelligentsia translates itself into policy as a rain of cluster bombs and napalm. In fact, the liberal experts have been dismayed by the emphasis on military means in Vietnam and have consistently argued that the key to our efforts should be social restructuring and economic assistance. Correspondingly, I think that we can perceive more clearly the attitudes that are crystallizing among the new mandarins by considering the technical studies of pacification, for example, the research monograph of William Nysonger, cited earlier, see note 4. The author, now a professor of political science, 
was senior United States civilian representative of the Agency for International Development in Quang Nam Province from 1962 to 1964. As he sees the situation, the knotty problems of pacification are intricately intertwined with the issues of political development and they necessitate, at this time in history, intimate American involvement. Thus Americans must ask some basic questions of value and obligation, questions that transcend the easy legalisms of self-determination and non-intervention. These easy legalisms have little relevance to a world in which the West is challenged by the sophisticated methodology and quasi-religious motivation of communist insurgency. It is our duty, in the interest of democracy and freedom, to apply our expertise to these twin goals, to isolate the enemy and destroy his influence and control over the rural population, and to win the peasants' willing support through effective local administration and programs of rural improvement. An underlying assumption is that insurgency ought to be defeated, for the sake of human rights. Despite the remarkable achievements in economic and social development in Russia and China, the South Vietnamese peasant deserves something better, and we must give it to him. As we have in Latin America and the Philippines. Even if this requires abandoning the easy legalisms of the past and intervening with military force. Of course, it won't be easy. The enemy has enormous advantages. For one thing, as in China, the insurgents in Vietnam have exploited the Confucian tenets of ethical rule both by their attacks on government corruption and by exemplary communist behavior, and the Viet Cong inherited, after Geneva, much of the popular support and sympathies previously attached to the Viet Minh in the South. After the fall of Diem, matters became still worse. Vast regions that had been under government control quickly came under the influence of the Viet Cong. By late 1964 the pacification of Quang Nam province had become all but impossible, and the worst of it is that the battle for Quang Nam was lost by the government to Viet Cong forces recruited for the most part from within the province. By 1966, the Viet Cong seemed so well entrenched in rural areas that only a highly imaginative and comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign, with nearly perfect execution and substantial military support, would be capable of dislodging such a powerful and extensive insurgent apparatus. A major difficulty we face is the progressive social and economic results shown by the Viet Cong efforts. An aid report in March 1965 explains the problem. Comparing our new life hamlets to the Viet Cong hamlets, the report comments as follows. Quote, the basic differences are that the VC hamlets are well organized, clean, economically self-supporting and have an active defense system. For example, a cottage industry in one hamlet was as large as has been previously witnessed anywhere in Chuang Tien province. New canals are being dug and pineapples are under cultivation. The VC also have a relocation program for younger families. These areas coincide with the areas just outside the planned GVN sphere of interest. Unless the USOM slash GVN activities exhibit a more qualitative basis, there is little likelihood of changing the present attitudes of the people. For example, in one area only 5 kilometers from the province capital, the people refused medical assistance offered by Arvin Medics. Quote. However, all is not lost. Even though the Viet Cong strength in the countryside has made a quantum leap from its position of early 1962, there is a compensating factor, namely, the counterinsurgent military capability was revolutionized by substantial American troop inputs. This allows us entirely new options. For example, we can implement more effectively some of the experiments with population and resources control methods that were tried by the USOM and the National Police as early as 1961, though with little success. Given the new possibilities for material and human resources control, we may even recapture some of the population. A serious matter, given the enormous numbers of South Vietnamese citizens presently allied with the Viet Cong, for whatever reason, the recovery of these peasants for the national cause must be made one of the central tasks of the pacification enterprise. If we are going to succeed in implementing material and human resources control, we must moderate Arvin behavior somehow. 
Thus, according to an aid report of February 1965, a high incident rate of stealing, robbing, raping and obtaining free meals in the rural areas has not endeared the population towards urban or regional forces. Nor did it improve matters when many civilians witnessed a case in which an Arvin company leader killed a draft dodger, disemboweled him, took his heart and liver out and had them cooked at a restaurant, after which the heart and liver were eaten by a number of soldiers. Such acts cause great difficulties, especially in trying to combat an enemy so vile as to practice exemplary communist behavior. More generally, the success of pacification requires that there be survivors to be pacified, and given the sheer magnitude of American, Korean, Australian and indigenous Vietnamese forces, which has so severely strained the economic and social equilibrium of the nation, it is sometimes difficult to ensure this minimal condition. There are other problems, for example, the difficulty of denying food to the enemy in the Mekong Delta, the hunger for land ownership, which, for some curious reason, is never satisfied by our friends in Saigon, the corruption, occasional bombing of the wrong village, the pervasive Viet Cong infiltration of military and civilian government organization, the fact that when we relocate peasants to new hamlets, we often leave the fox still in the hen house, because of inadequate police methods, and so on. Still, we have a good pacification theory, which involves three steps, elimination of the Viet Cong by search and destroy operations, protection and control of the population and its resources by police and military forces, and preparing and arming the peasants to defend their own communities. If we rarely reach the third stage, this is because we have not yet learned to share the sense of urgency of the revolutionary cause, or to nourish these attitudes among our Vietnamese associates. Thus we understand that the real revolution is the one we are implementing, in contrast to the artificially stimulated and controlled revolution of Diem and the communists, but we have difficulties in communicating this fact to the Vietnamese peasant or to our Vietnamese associates. What is needed, clearly, is better training for American officials, and of course, true national dedication to this humanitarian task. A grave defect in our society, this political scientist argues, is our tendency to avoid an active American role in the fostering of democratic institutions abroad. The pacification program in Vietnam represents an attempt to meet our responsibility to foster democratic institutions abroad, through rational methods of material and human resources control. Refusal to dedicate ourselves to this task might be described as a policy more selfish and timid than it was broad and enlightened, to use the terminology of an earlier day. When we strip away the terminology of the behavioral sciences, we see revealed, in such work as this, the mentality of the colonial civil servant, persuaded of the benevolence of the mother country and the correctness of its vision of world order, and convinced that he understands the true interests of the backward peoples whose welfare he is to administer. In fact, much of the scholarly work on Southeast Asian affairs reflects precisely this mentality. As an example, consider the August 1967 issue of Asian Survey, fully devoted to a Vietnam symposium in which a number of experts contribute their thoughts on the success of our enterprise and how it can be moved forward. The introductory essay by Samuel Huntington, chairman of the Department of Government at Harvard, is entitled Social Science and Vietnam. It emphasizes the need to develop scholarly study and understanding of Vietnam if our involvement is to succeed, and expresses his judgment that the papers in this volume demonstrate that issues and topics closely connected to policy can be presented and analyzed in scholarly and objective fashion. Huntington's own contribution to scholarly study and understanding of Vietnam includes an article in the Boston Globe, February 17, 1968. Here he describes the momentous changes in Vietnamese society during the past five years, specifically, the process of urbanization. This process struck directly at the strength and potential appeal of the Viet Cong. So long as the overwhelming mass of the people lived in the countryside, the VC could win the war by winning control of those people, and they came very close to doing so in both 1961 and 1964. But the American-sponsored urban revolution undercut the VC rural revolution. 
the refugees fleeing from the rural areas found not only security but also prosperity and economic well-being. While wartime urban prosperity hurt some, the mass of the poor people benefited from it. The sources of urbanization have been described clearly many times, for example, by this American spokesman in Vietnam, there have been three choices open to the peasantry. 1. To stay where they are, 2. To move into the areas controlled by us, 3. To move off into the interior towards the Viet Cong. Our operations have been designed to make the first choice impossible, the second attractive, and to reduce the likelihood of anyone choosing the third to zero. The benefits accruing to the newly urbanized elements have also been amply described in the press, for example, by James Doyle of The Globe, February 22, 1968, Saigon is a rich city, the bar owners, b-girls, money changers and black marketeers all making their fortunes while it lasts. It is a poor city, with hundreds of thousands of refugees crammed into thatched huts and tin-roofed shacks, more than 2 million people shoehorned into 21 square miles. Or Neil Sheehan, in a classic and often quoted article, New York Times, October 9, 1966. Quote. A drive through Saigon demonstrates another fashion in which the social system works. Virtually all the new construction consists of luxury apartments, hotels, and office buildings financed by Chinese businessmen or affluent Vietnamese with relatives or connections within the regime. The buildings are destined to be rented to Americans. Saigon's workers live, as they always have, in fetid slums on the city's outskirts. Bars and bordellos, thousands of young Vietnamese women degrading themselves as bar girls and prostitutes, gangs of hoodlums and beggars and children selling their older sisters and picking pockets have become ubiquitous features of urban life. Quote. Many have remarked on the striking difference between the way in which the press and the visiting scholar describe what they see in Vietnam. It should occasion no surprise. Each is pursuing his own craft. The reporter's job is to describe what he sees before his eyes, many have done so with courage and even brilliance. The colonial administrator, on the other hand, is concerned to justify what he has done and what he hopes to do, and, if an expert as well, to construct an appropriate ideological cover, to show that we are just and righteous in what we do, and to put nagging doubts to rest. One sees moral degradation and fetid slums, the other, prosperity and well-being. And if kindly old Uncle Sam occasionally flicks his ashes on someone by mistake, that is surely no reason for tantrums. Returning to the collection of scholarly and objective studies in Asian Survey, the first, by Kenneth Young, president of the Asia Society, describes our difficulties in transferring innovations and institutions to the Vietnamese and calls for the assistance of social scientists in overcoming these difficulties. Social scientists should, he feels, study the intricacies that effectively inhibit or transfer what the Americans, either by government policy or by the technician's action, want to introduce into the mind of a Vietnamese or into a Vietnamese organization. The problem, in short, is one of communication. For this objective scholar, there is no question of our right to transfer innovations and institutions to the Vietnamese, by force if necessary, or of our superior insight into the needed innovations or appropriate institutions. In just the same way, Lord Cornwallis understood the necessity of transferring the institution of a squirearchy to India. As any reasonable person could see, this was the only civilized form of social organization. The scholarly objectivity that Huntington lauds is further demonstrated in the contribution by Milton Sachs, entitled Restructuring Government in South Vietnam. As Sachs perceives the situation, there are two forces in South Vietnam, the nationalists and the communists. The communists are the Viet Minh and the NLF, among the nationalists, he mentions specifically the VNQDD and the Die Viet, and the military. The nationalists have a few problems, for example, they were manipulated by the French, by the Japanese, by the communists and latterly by the Americans, and too many of South Vietnam's leading generals fought with the French against the Vietnamese people. 
Our problem is the weakness of the nationalists, although there was some hope during General Khan's government, a most interesting effort because it was a genuine coalition of representatives of all the major political groups in South Vietnam. Curiously, this highly representative government was unable to accept or even to consider a proposal for what appeared to be an authentic coalition government coming from the National Liberation Front in mid-1964. According to Douglas Pike, the proposal could not be seriously considered because none of the non-communists in South Vietnam, with the possible exception of the Buddhists, thought themselves equal in size and power to risk entering into a coalition, fearing that if they did the whale would swallow the minnow. Thus, he continues, coalition government with a strong NLF could not be sold within South Vietnam, even to the government which, as Sachs informs us, was a genuine coalition of all the major political groups in South Vietnam. Rather, the GVN and its successors continued to insist that the NLF show their sincerity by withdrawing their armed units and their political cadre from South Vietnamese territory, March 1, 1965. According to Sachs, the problem which presents itself is to devise an institutional arrangement that will tend to counteract the factors and forces which are conducive to that instability that now plagues Vietnamese political life. This problem, of course, is one that presents itself to us. And, Sachs feels, it is well on its way to solution, with the new constitution and the forthcoming, September 1967, elections, which will provide spokesmen who claim legitimacy through popular mandate and speak with authority on the issues of war and peace for their constituency. Although this free election will still leave unrepresented those who are fighting under the banner of the South Vietnam National Liberation Front and those whose candidates were not permitted to stand in the elections, we must, after all, understand that no institution in the real world can be perfect. The important thing, according to Sachs, is that for the first time since the fall of Diem, there will be elections that are not seen by the government in power simply as a means of legitimating the power they already had, using the governmental machinery to underwrite themselves. Putting aside the remarkable naivete regarding the forthcoming elections, what is striking is the implicit assumption that we have a right to continue our efforts to restructure the South Vietnamese government, in the interests of what we determine to be Vietnamese nationalism. In just the same way, the officers of the Quantung Army sought to support genuine Manchurian nationalism, 35 years ago. To understand more fully what is implied by the judgment that we must defend the nationalists against the communists, we can turn again to Pike's interesting study. The nationalist groups mentioned by Sachs are the VNQDD and the Die Viet. The former, after its virtual destruction by the French, was revived by the Chinese nationalists in 1942. It supported itself through banditry. It executed traitors with a great deal of publicity, and its violent acts in general were carefully conceived for their psychological value. Returning to Vietnam with the occupying Chinese forces following World War II, it was of some importance until mid-1946, when it was purged by the Viet Minh. The VNQDD never was a mass political party in the Western sense. At its peak of influence it numbered, by estimates of its own leaders, less than 1500 persons. Nor was it ever particularly strong in either Central or South Vietnam. It had no formal structure and held no conventions or assemblies. As to the Dai Viet, Dai Viet membership included leading Vietnamese figures and governmental officials who viewed Japan as a suitable model for Vietnam. Note well. Fascist Japan. The organization never made any particular obeisance either to democracy or to the rank and file Vietnamese. It probably never numbered more than 1,000 members and did not consider itself a mass based organization. It turned away from Western liberalism although its economic orientation was basically socialist, in favor of authoritarianism and blind obedience. During World War II, it was at all times strongly pro-Japanese. In contrast to these genuine nationalists, we have the Viet Minh, whose war was anti-colonial, clearly nationalistic, and concerned all Vietnamese, and the NLF, 
which regarded the rural Vietnamese not simply as a pawn in a power struggle but as the active element in the thrust, which maintained that its contest with the GVN and the United States should be fought out at a political level and that the use of massed military might was in itself illegitimate, until forced by the Americans and the GVN to use counterforce to survive. In its internal documents as well as its public pronouncements the NLF insisted, from its earliest days, that its goal must be to set up a democratic national coalition administration in South Vietnam, realize independence, democratic freedoms and improvement of the people's living conditions, safeguard peace, and achieve national reunification on the basis of independence and democracy. Aside from the NLF there has never been a truly mass-based political party in South Vietnam. It organized the rural population through the instrument of self-control, victory by means of the organizational weapon, setting up a variety of self-help functional liberation associations based on associational discipline coupled with the right of freedom of discussion and secret vote at association meetings, and generating a sense of community, first, by developing a pattern of political thought and behavior appropriate to the social problems of the rural Vietnamese village in the midst of sharp social change and, second, by providing a basis for group action that allowed the individual villager to see that his own efforts could have meaning and effect, obviously, a skilled and treacherous enemy. This was, of course, prior to the advent of massive American aid, and the GVN's strategic Hamlet program. With the American takeover of the war, the emphasis shifted to military rather than political action, and ultimately, North Vietnamese involvement and perhaps control, beginning in 1965, large numbers of regular army troops from North Vietnam were sent into South Vietnam. In short, what we see is a contrast between the Dai Viet and VNQDD, representing South Vietnamese nationalism, and the NLF, an extrinsic alien force. One must bear in mind that Sachs would undoubtedly accept Pike's factual description as accurate, but, like Pike, would regard it as demonstrating nothing, since we are the ultimate arbiters of what counts as genuine Vietnamese nationalism. An interesting counterpoint to Sachs's exposition of nationalist versus communist forces is provided in David Werfel's careful analysis, in the same issue of Asian Survey, of the Saigon political elite. He argues that this elite has not substantially changed its character in the last few years, i.e., since 1962, though there may be a few modifications, formerly, only among the great landlords were there those who held significant amounts of both political and economic power, grandiose corruption may have allowed others to attain that distinction in recent years. Continuing, the military men in post-DM cabinets all served under Baudai and the French in a civil or military capacity. Under the French, those who felt most comfortable about entering the civil service were those whose families were already part of the bureaucratic intellectual elite. By the early 1950s they saw radicalism, in the form of the Viet Minh, as a threat to their own position. The present political elite is the legacy of these developments. Although, he observes, things might change, the South Vietnamese cabinets and perhaps most of the rest of the political elite have been constituted by a highly westernized intelligentsia. Though the people of South Vietnam seem to be in a revolutionary mood, this elite is hardly revolutionary. The NLF constitutes a counter-elite, less westernized, of the NLF Central Committee members, only 3 out of 27 report studying in France. The problem of restructuring government is further analyzed by Ethiel Poole, along lines that parallel Sachs's contribution to this collection of scholarly, objective studies. He begins by formulating a general proposition. I rule out of consideration here a large range of viable political settlements, namely, those that involve the inclusion of the Viet Cong in a coalition government or even the persistence of the Viet Cong as a legal organization in South Vietnam. Such arrangements are not acceptable. To us, that is. The only acceptable settlement is one imposed by the GVN despite the persisting great political power of the Viet Cong. There is, of course, a certain difficulty. The Viet Cong is too strong to be simply beaten or suppressed. It follows, 
then, that we must provide inducements to the Viet Cong activists to join our enterprise. This should not prove too difficult, he feels. The Viet Cong leadership consists basically of bureaucratic types who are on the make. Cognitive dissonance theory suggests that this discontented leadership has the potential for making a total break when the going gets too rough. We must therefore provide them with a political rationalization for changing sides. The problem is ideological. We must induce a change in the image of reality of the Viet Cong cadres, replacing their naive ideology, which sees the GVN as American puppets and supporters of exploiters, the tax collectors, the merchants, the big landlords, the police, and the evil men in the villages, by a more realistic conception. We can do this by emphasizing Hamlet home rule and preventing the use of military forces to collect rents, a suggestion which will be greeted with enthusiasm in Saigon, no doubt. The opportunity to serve as functionaries for a central government which pursues such policies will attract the Viet Cong cadres and thus solve our problem, that of excluding from the political process the organization that contains the effective political leaders. Others have expressed a rather different evaluation of the human quality and motivation of these cadres. For example, Joseph Buttinger contrasts the inability of the DM regime to mobilize support with the success of the NLF. That people willing to serve their country were to be found in Vietnam no one could doubt. The Viet Minh had been able to enlist them by the tens of thousands and to extract from them superhuman efforts and sacrifices in the struggle for independence. Military reports by the dozens relate the amazing heroism and dedication of the guerrillas. Throughout history, however, colonial administrators have had their difficulties in comprehending or coming to grips with this phenomenon. In the course of his analysis of our dilemma in Vietnam, Poole explains some of the aspects of our culture that make it difficult for us to understand such matters clearly. We live in a guilt culture in which there is a tradition of belief in equality. For such reasons, we find it hard to understand the true nature of Viet Cong land redistribution, which is primarily a patronage operation in which dissatisfied peasants band together in a gang to despoil their neighbors and then reward the deserving members of the cabal. This terminology recalls Franz Borkenau's description of the streak of moral indifference in the history of Russian revolutionism, which permitted such atrocities as the willingness to expropriate, by means of robbery, the individual property of individual bourgeois. Our side, in contrast, adheres to the tradition of belief in equality when we implement land reform. For example, the New York Times, December 26, 1967, reports a recent conference of experts studying the Taiwan success in land reform, one of the real success stories of American intervention. The government reimbursed the former landlords in part, 30%, with shares of four large public enterprises taken over from the Japanese. The remainder was paid in bonds. Many speakers at the conference singled out the repayment as the shrewdest feature of the Taiwan program. It not only treated the landlords fairly, they said, but it also redirected the landlord's energies and capital towards industry, thus advancing the wholesale restructuring of society in the only healthy and humane direction. In a side remark, Poole states that in lay public debates now going on one often hears comments to the effect that Vietnamese communism, because it is anti-Chinese, would be like Yugoslav communism. It would, of course, be ridiculous to argue such a causal connection, and, in fact, I have never heard it proposed in lay public debate or anywhere else. Rather, what has been maintained by such laymen as Hans Morgenthau, General James Gavin, and others is that Vietnamese communism is likely to be Titoist in the sense that it will strive for independence from Chinese domination. Thus they reject the claim that by attacking Vietnamese communism we are somehow containing Chinese communism. A claim implied, for example, in the statement of the Citizens Committee for Peace with Freedom in Vietnam, in which Ethiel Poole, Milton Sachs, and others, speaking for the understanding, independent and responsible men and women who have consistently opposed rewarding international aggressors from Adolf Hitler to Mao Zedong, warn that if we abandon Vietnam, then Peking and Hanoi, flushed with success, 
will continue their expansionist policy through many other wars of liberation. By misstating the reference to Titoist tendencies, Poole avoids the difficulty of explaining how an anti-Chinese North Vietnam is serving as the agent of Hitlerian aggression from Peking, by referring to lay public debate, he hopes, I presume, to disguise the failure of argument by a claim to expertise. Returning again to the Asian Survey Vietnam Symposium, the most significant contribution is surely Edward Mitchell's discussion of his RAND Corporation study on the significance of land tenure in the Vietnamese insurgency. In a study of 26 provinces, Mitchell has discovered a significant correlation between inequality of land tenure and the extent of government, read, American, control. In brief, greater inequality implies greater control. Provinces seem to be more secure when the percentage of owner-operated land is low, tenancy is high, inequality in the distribution of farms by size is great, large, formerly French-owned estates are present, and no land redistribution has taken place. To explain this phenomenon, Mitchell turns to history and behavioral psychology. As he notes, in a number of historical cases it has been the better-to-do peasant who has revolted, while his poorer brothers actively supported or passively accepted the existing order. The behavioral explanation lies in the relative docility of poorer peasants and the firm authority of landlords in the more feudal areas. The landlord can exercise considerable influence over his tenant's behavior and readily discourage conduct inconsistent with his own interests. In an interview with The New York Times, October 15, 1967, Mitchell adds an additional explanation for the fact that the most secure areas are those that remain essentially feudal in social structure, when the feudal structure is eliminated, there's a vacuum and that is ideal for the Viet Cong because they've got an organization to fill the vacuum. This observation points to a difficulty that has always plagued the American effort. As Joseph Budinger points out, the DM regime too was unable to experiment with freely constituted organizations because these would have been captured by the Viet Minh. Mitchell's informative study supports an approach to counterinsurgency that has been expressed by Roger Hillsman, who explains that in his view, modernization cannot help much in a counter-guerrilla program, because it inevitably uproots established social systems and produces political and economic dislocation and tension. He therefore feels that popularity of governments, reform, and modernization may be important ingredients, but that their role in counterinsurgency must be measured more in terms of their contributions to physical security. Before leaving the Symposium on Social Science and Vietnam, we should take note of the scholarly detachment that permits one not to make certain comments or draw certain conclusions. For example, John Bennett discusses the important matter of geographic and job mobility, under the dual impact of improved opportunities elsewhere and deteriorating security at home, people are willing to move to a hitherto unbelievable extent. No further comment on this willingness, which provides such interesting new opportunities for the restructuring of Vietnamese society. John Donnell discusses the unusual success of pacification in Binh Dinh province, particularly in the areas controlled by the Koreans, who have tended to run their own show with their own methods and sometimes have not allowed the RAND team sent from Saigon all the operational leeway desired, and who have been extremely impressive in eliminating NLF influence. Again, no comment is given on these methods, amply reported in the press, or on the significance of the fact that Koreans are eliminating NLF influence from Vietnamese villages, and not allowing the Vietnamese government cod raise the leeway desired. Mitchell draws no policy conclusions from his study, but others have seen the point, recall the remarks of the moderate scholars on the dangers of social reform. Other scholars have carried the analysis much further. For example, Charles Wolfe, senior economist of the Rand Corporation, discusses the matter in a recent book. Wolf considers two theoretical models for analyzing insurgency problems. The first is the approach of the Hearts and Minds School of Counterinsurgency, which emphasizes the importance of popular support. Wolf agrees that it is no doubt a desirable goal to win popular allegiance to a government that is combating an insurgent movement, but this objective, he argues, is not appropriate as a conceptual framework for counterinsurgency programs. 
his alternative approach has as its unifying theme the concept of influencing behavior, rather than attitudes. Thus, confiscation of chickens, raising of houses, or destruction of villages have a place in counterinsurgency efforts, but only if they are done for a strong reason, namely, to penalize those who have assisted the insurgents. Whatever harshness is meted out by government forces must be unambiguously recognizable as deliberately imposed because of behavior by the population that contributes to the insurgent movement. Furthermore, it must be noted that policies that would increase rural income by raising food prices, or projects that would increase agricultural productivity through distribution of fertilizer or livestock, may be of negative value during an insurgency. Since they may actually facilitate guerrilla operations by increasing the availability of inputs that the guerrillas need. More generally, in setting up economic and social improvement programs, the crucial point is to connect such programs with the kind of population behavior the government wants to promote. The principle is to reward the villages that cooperate and to provide penalties for the behavior that the government is trying to discourage. At a broad, conceptual level, the main concern of counterinsurgency efforts should be to influence the behavior of the population rather than their loyalties and attitudes, the primary consideration should be whether the proposed measure is likely to increase the cost and difficulties of insurgent operations and help to disrupt the insurgent organization, rather than whether it wins popular loyalty and support, or whether it contributes to a more productive, efficient, or equitable use of resources. Other scholars have elaborated on the advantages of Wolf's alternative approach, which concerns itself with control of behavior rather than the mystique of popular support. For example, Morton H. Halperin, of the Harvard Center for International Affairs, writes that in Vietnam, the United States has been able to prevent any large-scale Viet Cong victories, regardless of the loyalties of the people. Thus we have an empirical demonstration of a certain principle of behavioral science, as Halperin notes. Quote, the events in Vietnam also illustrate the fact that most people tend to be motivated, not by abstract appeals, but rather by their perception of the course of action that is most likely to lead to their own personal security and to the satisfaction of their economic, social, and psychological desires. Thus, for example, large-scale American bombing in South Vietnam may have antagonized a number of people, but at the same time it demonstrated to these people that the Viet Cong could not guarantee their security as it had been able to do before the bombing and that the belief in an imminent victory for the Viet Cong might turn out to be dangerously false. Quote. In short, along with confiscation of chickens, raising of houses, or destruction of villages, we can also make effective use of 100 pounds of explosives per person, 12 tons per square mile, as in Vietnam, as a technique for controlling behavior, relying on the principle, now once again confirmed by experiment, that satisfaction of desires is a more important motivation in human behavior than abstract appeals to loyalty. Surely this is extremely sane advice. It would, for example, be absurd to try to control the behavior of a rat by winning its loyalty rather than by the proper scheduling of reinforcement. An added advantage of this new, more scientific approach is that it will modify the attitudes with which counterinsurgency efforts are viewed in the United States, when we turn to the United States, of course, we are concerned with people whose attitudes must be taken into account, not merely their behavior. It will help us overcome one of the main defects in the American character, the emotional reaction that leads us to side with crusaders for the common man and against a ruthless, exploitative tyrant. That there may be reality as well as appearance in this role casting is not the point. This sentimentality frequently interferes with a realistic assessment of alternatives, and inclines us instead toward a carping righteousness in our relations with the beleaguered government we are ostensibly supporting, it may be overcome by concentration on control of behavior rather than modification of attitudes or the winning of hearts and minds. Hence the new approach to counterinsurgency should not only be effective in extending the control of American approved governments, but it may also have a beneficial effect on us. The possibilities are awe-inspiring. 
Perhaps in this way we can even escape the confines of our guilt culture in which there is a tradition of belief in equality. It is extremely important, Wolf would claim, that we develop a rational understanding of insurgency, for insurgency is probably the most likely type of politico-military threat in the third world, and surely one of the most complex and challenging problems facing United States policies and programs. The primary objective of American foreign policy in the third world must be the denial of communist control, specifically, the support of countries that are defending their independence from external and internal communist domination. The latter problem, defending independence from internal communist domination, is the crucial problem, particularly in Latin America. We must counter the threat by a policy of promoting economic growth and modernization, making sure, however, to avoid the risks inherent in these processes, compare with Mitchell, above, combined with a responsible use of force. No question is raised about the appropriateness of our use of force in a country threatened by insurgency. The justification, were the question raised, is inherent in the assumption that we live in a world in which loss of national independence is often synonymous with communist control, and communism is implicitly considered to be irreversible. Thus, by Orwellian logic, we are actually defending national independence when we intervene with military force to protect a ruling elite from internal insurgency. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of scholarly work such as this is the way in which behavioral science rhetoric is used to lend a vague aura of respectability. One might construct some such chain of associations as this. Science, as everyone knows, is responsible, moderate, unsentimental, and otherwise good. Behavioral science tells us that we can be concerned only with behavior and control of behavior. Therefore we should be concerned only with behavior and control of behavior, and it is responsible, moderate, unsentimental, and otherwise good to control behavior by appropriately applied reward and punishment. Concern for loyalties and attitudes is emotional and unscientific. As rational men, believers in the scientific ethic, we should be concerned with manipulating behavior in a desirable direction, and not be deluded by mystical notions of freedom, individual needs, or popular will. Let me make it clear that I am not criticizing the behavioral sciences because they lend themselves to such perversion. On other grounds, the behavioral persuasion seems to me to lack merit, it seriously mistakes the method of science and imposes pointless methodological strictures on the study of man and society, but this is another matter entirely. It is, however, fair to inquire to what extent the popularity of this approach is based on its demonstrated achievements, and to what extent its appeal is based on the ease with which it can be refashioned as a new coercive ideology with a faintly scientific tone. In passing, I think it is worth mention that the same questions can be raised outside of politics, specifically, in connection with education and therapy. The assumption that the colonial power is benevolent and has the interests of the natives at heart is as old as imperialism itself. Thus the liberal Herman Merivale, lecturing at Oxford in 1840, lauded the British policy of colonial enlightenment which stands in contrast to that of our ancestors, who cared little about the internal government of their colonies, and kept them in subjection in order to derive certain supposed commercial advantages from them, whereas we give them commercial advantages, and tax ourselves for their benefit, in order to give them an interest in remaining under our supremacy, that we may have the pleasure of governing them. And our own John Hay in 1898 outlined a partnership in beneficence which would bring freedom and civilization to Cuba, Hawaii, and the Philippines, just as the Pax Britannica had brought these benefits to India, Egypt, and South Africa. But although the benevolence of imperialism is a familiar refrain, the idea that the issue of benevolence is irrelevant, an improper, sentimental consideration, is something of an innovation in imperialist rhetoric, a contribution of the sort one might perhaps expect from the new mandarins whose claim to power is based on knowledge and technique. Going a step beyond, notice how perverse is the entire discussion of the conceptual framework for counterinsurgency. The idea that we must choose between the method of winning hearts and minds and the method of shaping behavior presumes that we have the right to choose at all. 
This is to grant us a right that we would surely accord to no other world power. Yet the overwhelming body of American scholarship accords us this right. For example, William Henderson, formerly Associate Executive Director and Far Eastern Specialist for the Council on Foreign Relations, proposes that we must prosecute a constructive, manipulative diplomacy in order to deal with internal subversion, particularly in the form of communist-instigated guerrilla warfare or insurgency. Internal aggression, as he calls it, in accordance with contemporary usage. Our historic tasks, he proclaims, are nothing less than to assist purposefully and constructively in the processes of modern nation building in Southeast Asia, to deflect the course of a fundamental revolution into channels compatible with the long-range interests of the United States. It is understood that true nation building is that path of development compatible with our interests, hence there is no difficulty in pursuing these historic tasks in concert. There are, however, two real stumbling blocks in the way of the required manipulative diplomacy. The first is a great psychological barrier. We must learn to abandon old dogma and pursue a new diplomacy that is frankly interventionist, recognizing that it goes counter to all the traditional conventions of diplomatic usage. Some may ask whether we have the moral right to interfere in the properly autonomous affairs of others, but Henderson feels that the communist threat fully justifies such interference and urges that we be ready to use our special forces when the next bell rings, with no moral qualms or hesitation. The second barrier is that our knowledge is pitifully inadequate. He therefore calls on the academic community, which will be only too willing to oblige, to supply the body of expertise and the core of specialists, the knowledge, the practitioners, and the teachers, to enable us to conduct such a resourceful diplomacy more effectively. Turning to the liberal wing, we find that Roger Hillsman has a rather similar message in his study of the diplomacy of the Kennedy administration, to move a nation. He informs us that the most divisive issue among the hard-headed and pragmatic liberals of the Kennedy team was how the United States should deal with the problem of modern guerrilla warfare, as the communists practice it. The problem is that this is internal war, an ambiguous aggression that avoids direct and open attack violating international frontiers. Apparently, the hard-headed and pragmatic liberals were never divided on the issue of our right to violate international frontiers in reacting to such internal war. As a prime example of the kind of critical, searching analysis that the new, liberal, revitalized State Department was trying to encourage, Hillsman cites a study directed to showing how the United States might have acted more effectively to overthrow the Mossadegh government in Iran. Alan Dulles was fundamentally right, according to Hillsman, in judging that Mossadegh in Iran, like Arbenz in Guatemala, had come to power, to be sure, through the usual processes of government, with the intention of creating a communist state. A most amazing statement on the part of the State Department Chief of Intelligence, and Dulles was fundamentally right in urging support from the United States to loyal anti-communist elements in Iran and Guatemala to meet the danger, even though no invitation was extended by the government in power, obviously. Hillsman expresses the liberal view succinctly in the distinction he draws between the Iranian subversion and the blundering attempt at the Bay of Pigs, it is one thing, to help the Shah's supporters in Iran in their struggle against Mossadegh and his communist allies, but it is something else again to sponsor a thousand-man invasion against Castro's Cuba, where there was no effective internal opposition. The former effort was admirable, the latter, bound to fail, is something else again from the point of view of pragmatic liberalism. In Vietnam, liberal interventionism was not properly conducted, and the situation got out of hand. We learn more about the character of this approach to international affairs by studying a more successful instance. Thailand is a case in point, and a useful perspective on liberal American ideology is given by the careful and informative work of Frank C. Darling, a Kennedy liberal who was a CIA analyst for Southeast Asia and is now chairman of the political science department at DePauw University. The facts relevant to this discussion, as Darling outlines them, are briefly as follows. At the end of World War II the former British minister, Sir Josiah Crosby, warned that unless the power of the Thai armed forces was reduced, 
the establishment of a constitutional government would be doomed and the return of a military dictatorship would be inevitable. American policy in the post-war period was to support and strengthen the armed forces and the police, and Crosby's prediction was borne out. There were incipient steps towards constitutional government in the immediate post-war period. However, a series of military coups established by Bun Song Krum, who had collaborated with the Japanese during the war, as premier in 1948, aborting these early efforts. The American reaction to the liberal governments had been ambiguous and temporizing. In contrast, Fibon was immediately recognized by the United States. Why? Within this increasingly turbulent region Thailand was the only nation that did not have a communist insurrection within its borders and it was the only country that remained relatively stable and calm. As the United States considered measures to deter communist aggression in Southeast Asia, a conservative and anti-communist regime in Thailand became increasingly attractive regardless of its internal policies or methods of achieving power. Phi Bun got the point. In August 1949, he stated that foreign pressure had become alarming and that internal communist activity had vigorously increased. In 1950, Truman approved a $10 million grant for military aid. The new rulers made use of the substantial American military aid to convert the political system into a more powerful and ruthless form of authoritarianism, and to develop an extensive system of corruption, nepotism, and profiteering that helped maintain the loyalty of their followers. At the same time, American corporations moved in, purchasing large quantities of rubber and tin. Shipments of raw materials now went directly to the United States instead of through Hong Kong and Singapore. By 1958, the United States purchased 90% of Thailand's rubber and most of its tin. American investment, however, remained low, because of the political instability as well as the problems caused by more extensive public ownership and economic planning. To improve matters, the Sarit dictatorship, see below, introduced tax benefits and guarantees against nationalization and competition from government-owned commercial enterprises, and finally banned trade with China and abolished all monopolies, government, or private, in an attempt to attract private foreign capital. American influence gave material and moral support to the Phi Bun dictatorship and discouraged the political opposition. It strengthened the executive power and encouraged the military leaders to take even stronger measures in suppressing local opposition, using the excuse that all anti-government activity was communist-inspired. In 1954, Preeti Young, a liberal intellectual who had been the major participant in the overthrow of the absolute monarchy in 1932, had led the Free Thai Underground during the war, and had been elected in 1946 when Thai democracy reached an all-time high, appeared in Communist China, the United States was supporting Phi Bun, who had been an ally of the Japanese, while Preeti, who had courageously assisted the OSS, was in Peking cooperating with the Chinese Communists. This was ironic. It is difficult to imagine what sort of development towards a constitutional, parliamentary system might have taken place had it not been for American-supported subversion. The liberals were extremely weak in any event, in particular because of the domination of the economy by Western and Chinese enterprises linked with the corrupt governmental bureaucracy. The coup group that had overthrown the government was composed almost entirely of commoners, many of whom had come from the peasantry or low-ranking military and civil service families, and who now wanted their share in corruption and authoritarian control. The opposition Democrats were, for the most part, members of the royal family or conservative landowners who wanted to preserve their role in the government and their personal wealth. Whatever opportunities might have existed for the development of some more equitable society disappeared once the American presence became dominant, however. Surely any Thai liberal reformer must have been aware of this by 1950, in the wake of the coups, the farcical rigged elections, the murder and torture of leaders of the Free Thai anti-Japanese underground, the takeover by the military of the political and much of the commercial system. Particularly when he listened to the words of American Ambassador Stanton as he signed a new aid agreement, 
The American people fully support this program of aid to Thailand because of their deep interest in the Thai people whose devotion to the ideals of freedom and liberty and wholehearted support of the UN have won the admiration of the American people. A notable trend throughout this period was the growing intimacy between the Thai military leaders and the top-level military officials from the United States, who helped them obtain large-scale foreign aid which in turn bolstered their political power. The head of the American military mission, Colonel Charles Sheldon, stated that Thailand was threatened by armed aggression by people who do not believe in democracy, who do not believe in freedom or the dignity of the individual man as do the people of Thailand and my country. Adlai Stevenson, in 1953, warned the Thai leaders that their country was the real target of the Viet Minh, and expressed his hope that they fully appreciate the threat. Meanwhile, United States assistance had built a powerful army and supplied the police with tanks, artillery, armored cars, an air force, naval patrol vessels, and a training school for paratroopers. The police achieved one of the highest ratios of policemen to citizens in the world. About 1 to 400. The police chief meanwhile relied on his monopoly of the opium trade and his extensive commercial enterprises for the income he needed to support his personal political machine, while the army chief received an enormous income from the national lottery. It was later discovered that the chief of police had committed indescribable atrocities, the extent of the torture and murder committed by the former police chief will probably never be known. What is known is what came to light after Sarit, the army chief, took power in a new coup in 1957. Sarit stressed the need to maintain a stable government and intensify the suppression of local communists to ensure continued American trust, confidence, and aid. The Americans were naturally gratified, and the official reaction was very favorable. When Sarit died in 1963 it was discovered that his personal fortune reached perhaps $137 million. Both Darling and Roger Hillsman refer to him as a benevolent dictator, perhaps because he realized that communism could not be stopped solely by mass arrests, firing squads, or threats of brutal punishment, and launched a development project in the northeast regions, along with various other mild reforms. Without, however, ceasing the former practices, which he felt might impress the Americans again with the need for more military and economic aid to prevent communist subversion. He also imposed rigid censorship, abolished trade organizations and labor unions and punished suspected communists without mercy, and, as noted earlier, took various steps to attract foreign investment. By 1960, 12% of American foreign aid to Thailand since the beginning of the Cold War had been devoted to economic and social advancement. The effect of the American aid was clear. The vast material and diplomatic support provided to the military leaders by the United States helped to prevent the emergence of any competing groups who might check the trend toward absolute political rule and lead the country back to a more modern form of government. In fiscal 1963, the Kennedy administration tried to obtain from Congress $50 million in military aid for Thailand, perhaps to commemorate these achievements. The Kennedy administration brought good intentions and well-founded policy proposals, but otherwise made no significant modifications in the military-oriented policy in Thailand. These excerpts give a fair picture of the American impact on Thailand, as it emerges from Darling's account. Naturally, he is not too happy about it. He is disturbed that American influence frustrated the moves towards constitutional democracy and contributed to an autocratic rule responsible for atrocities that sometimes rivaled those of the Nazis and the Communists. He is also disturbed by our failure to achieve real control, in his terms, security, and stability, through these measures. Thus when Sarit took power in the 1957 coup, the Americans had no assurance that he would not orient a new regime towards radical economic and social programs as Castro, for example, has done in Cuba. At stake was an investment of about $300 million in military equipment and a gradually expanding economic base which could have been used against American interests in Southeast Asia had it fallen into unfriendly hands. Fortunately, these dire consequences did not ensue, and in place of radical economic and social programs there was merely a continuation of the same old terror and corruption. 
The danger was real, however. What conclusions does Darling draw from this record? As he sees it, there are four major alternatives for American foreign policy. The first would be to abolish its military program and withdraw American troops from the country. This, however, would be irrational, because throughout the non-communist world respect for American patience and tolerance in dealing with non-democratic governments would decline, furthermore, Thailand's security and economic progress would be jeopardized. To the pragmatic liberal, it is clear that confidence in our commitment to military dictatorships such as that in Thailand must be maintained, as in fact was implied by the moderate scholars document discussed earlier, and it would surely be unfortunate to endanger the prospects for further development along the lines that were initiated in such a promising way under American influence, and that are now secured by some 40,000 American troops. A second alternative would be neutralization of Thailand and other nations in Southeast Asia. This also is irrational. For one thing, the withdrawal of the American military presence would not be matched by the removal of any communist forces there being no non-indigenous communist forces. And therefore we would gain nothing by this strategy. Furthermore, we could never be certain that there would not be infiltration of communist insurgents in the future. And finally, the Thai leaders have decided to cooperate with the United States, for reasons that are hardly obscure. A third alternative would be to use our power in Thailand to push political and economic reforms. But this policy alternative would do great damage to American strategy in Thailand and other non-communist nations. And what is more, extensive interference in the domestic affairs of other nations, no matter how well-intentioned, is contrary to American traditions, as our post-war record in Thailand clearly demonstrates. Therefore, we must turn to the fourth alternative, and maintain our present policy. This alternative is probably the most rational and realistic. The military policy can be enhanced if it is realized that only American military power is capable of preventing large-scale overt aggression in Southeast Asia, and the proper role for the Thai armed forces is to be prepared to cope with limited guerrilla warfare. This exposition of United States policy in Thailand and the directions it should take conforms rather well to the general lines of pragmatic liberalism as drawn by Hillsman, among others. It also indicates clearly the hope that we offer today to the countries on the fringes of Asia. Vietnam may be an aberration. Our impact on Thailand, however, can hardly be attributed to the politics of inadvertence. An interesting sidelight is Darling's explanation in Thailand and the United States of how, in an earlier period, the Western concept of the rule of law was disseminated through American influence. Evidence that some officials were obtaining an understanding of the rule of law was revealed by the statement of a Thai minister who pointed out that it is essential to the prosperity of a nation that it should have fixed laws, and that nobles should be restrained from oppressing the people, otherwise the latter were like chickens, who instead of being kept for their eggs, were killed off. In its international behavior as well, the Thai government came to understand the necessity for the rule of law. A growing respect for law was also revealed in the adherence of the Thai government to the unequal restrictions contained in the treaties with the Western nations in spite of the heavy burden they imposed on the finances of the kingdom. This is all said without irony. In fact, the examples clarify nicely what the rule of law means to weak nations, and to the exploited in any society. Darling, Hillsman, and many others whom I have been discussing represent the moderate liberal wing of scholarship on international affairs. It may be useful to sample some of the other views that appear in American scholarship. Consider, for example, the proposals of Thomas R. Adam, professor of political science at New York University. Adam begins by outlining an ideal solution to American problems in the Pacific, towards which we should bend our efforts. The ideal solution would have the United States recognized as the responsible military protagonist of all Western interests in the area with a predominant voice in a unified Western policy. United States sovereignty over some territorial base in the area would give us ideal conditions for extending power over adjoining regions. Such a base would permit the formation of a regional organization, under our dominance, that would make possible direct intervention in Korea, 
Vietnam, Laos and Cambodia without the onus of unilateral intervention, in the face of brazen communist aggression, it is not the fact of intervention as such that constitutes the issue but rather its unilateral character. We must understand that for the preservation of Western interests, there is no reasonable alternative to the construction of such a base of power in territories over which we possess direct sovereignty. We cannot maintain the historic connection between Asia and the West unless we participate in Asian affairs through the exercise of power and influence. We must accept the fact that we are engaged in a serious struggle for cultural survival that involves that continuous presence of Western-oriented communities in Asia. It is an illusion to believe that we can retreat from Asia and leave it to its own devices, for our own Western culture must be understood as a minority movement of recent date in the evolution of civilization and it cannot be taken for granted that Asia will remain incapable of intervening in our affairs. Thus to defend ourselves, we must intervene with force in the affairs of Asia. If we fail to establish our industrial enterprise system universally, we will have to defend our privileges and gains by means of the continuing, brutalizing, and costly exercise of superior force in every corner of the globe. Why are we justified in forceful intervention in the affairs of Asia? One obvious justification for United States intervention in Asian affairs lies in our leadership of the world's struggle against communism. Communist political and economic infiltration among a majority of the world's peoples appears to American political leadership to be fatal to our safety and progress, this attitude is supported almost unanimously by public opinion. Pursuing this logic a few steps further, we will soon have the same obvious justification for taking out China with nuclear weapons. And perhaps France as well, for good measure. Further justification is that the defense of our western seaboard requires that the North Pacific be controlled as a virtual American lake, a fact which provides one basis for United States intervention in power struggles throughout the region, to preserve the security of this mare nostrum. Our victory over Japan left a power vacuum in Southeast Asia and the Far East that was tempting to communist aggression, therefore, we had to step in and use our military power. Island possessions, such as Guam, those of the Strategic Trust territories, and probably Okinawa, remain indispensable, if not to the narrow defense of our shores, certainly to the military posture essential to our total security and world aims. Apart from the magnificent scope of this vision, rarely equaled by our forerunners, the terminology is not unfamiliar. There are, to be sure, certain restraints that we must observe as we design our policy of establishing an operational base for exercise of power in the Far East, specifically, policy must rest on political and social objectives that are acceptable to, or capable of being imposed upon, all participating elements. Obviously, it would not be pragmatic to insist upon policies that are not capable of being imposed upon the participating elements in our new dominions. These proposals are buttressed with a brief sketch of the consequences of Western Dominion in the past, for example, the Indian success story, in which enterprise capital proved a useful incentive to fruitful social change in the subcontinent of India and its environs, a development flawed only by the passivity shown by traditional Asian social systems as they imitated the industrial ideology of their colonial tutor. An important lesson to us is the success of the neutral Pax Britannica in imposing order, so that commerce could flourish and its fruits compensate for vanished liberties. Adam spares us the observation that the ungrateful natives sometimes fail to appreciate these centuries of solicitude. Thus to a left-wing member of the Congress party in India, the story is that the British, in the process of their domination over India, kept no limits to brutality and savagery which man is capable of practicing. Hitler's depredations, his Dachau's and Belsen's pale into insignificance before this imperialist savagery. Such a reaction to centuries of selfless and tender care might cause some surprise, until we realize that it is probably only an expression of the enormous guilt felt by the beneficiary of these attentions. A generation ago, there were other political leaders who feared the effect of communist gains on their safety and progress, and who, with the almost unanimous support of public opinion, set out to improve the world through forceful intervention. 
filling power vacuums, establishing territorial bases essential to their total security and world aims, imposing political and social objectives on participating elements. Professor Adam has little to tell us that is new. <laughs>